Okay guys, um, I'm Dr. Darren Edwards and this is a um, short session in terms of uh, exploring research methods, uh, particularly in psychology. Uh, they're also relevant to social sciences in many cases and I'll explain that in a minute. So, um, the very first thing you need to understand about um, the way that psychologists do experiments is they, at the heart of their experiments they have an aim and a hypothesis which is a prediction, a very specific prediction. So the aim of a study is a statement of what the researcher intends to investigate. The hypothesis of the study is a prediction which can be verified or disproved by an experiment. You can have um, directional or non-directional hypotheses. A directional hypothesis indicates a direction in the prediction, um, a one-tailed test, e.g. Um, students who sleep a full eight hours will perf perform better in exams than students who do not. It's a very specific direction. It implies that the student needs to sleep a full eight hours in order to perform uh, better than those who um, get less sleep. A non-directional hypothesis does not indicate a direction in the prediction. This is called a two-tailed test. An example of this would be um, student sleep length or number of hours a student sleeps will affect, will affect um, student exam performance. So in that particular situation, you can see there is no direction. It's not specifying whether more or less amount of time will affect the student's exam performance. It's simply saying that the length of time will have an effect on the exam performance. So that's the crucial difference between those. Now, another thing we need to understand when we're doing uh, psychological research methods is our sampling, our sampling strategy. A sample is the participants you select from a target population, the group you're interested in to make generalizations about. So a target population might be, let's say, a group of people that have, let's say, low back pain. Now, individuals who suffer from low back pain um, may experience um, certain levels of anxiety, uh, depression, and so forth. So um, you're using a target population, that's people who have low back pain. And you're gonna do an experiment on a small sample. Of course, you can't, um, you can't recruit in your study every single person in the world um, with low back pain. So you're taking a target, a certain uh, sample of that, and then you generalize about all people on the basis of your study. Now, a volunteer, volunteer sample is where participants pick themselves through, let's say, study adverts, notice boards, or online um, indications that there's a study available. So crucially, in this particular example, the volunteer is selecting themselves. So this often happens um, in uh, psychology departments where um, students have to run dissertation projects and a volunteer uh, participant who's usually another um, uh, student at the same uh, university in the same department uh, chooses to sign up to a dissertation study uh, simply to get um, what they call uh, credit points. Now these credit points enable um, the student who is applying for the study to one day then use the um, credit pool um, uh, site in order to recruit for their own uh, studies. So a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, psychology experiments are run using um, psychology students. Now there's huge uh, 
um, issues surrounding that because of course it is a very select sample. Can we really generalize um, from findings uh, of, of a purely psychological uh, student population to the general population? Now that's a tricky one. So we always have to weigh out um, the practical reasons for choosing a particular sample with what we actually want to find, how we want to generalize. So it's always a trade-off. There's no easy answer. Um, there's also opportunity sampling, um, which uses uh, people who are available at the time of study. So this could just be, let's say, people who are sitting in a particular room. Maybe you've got a uh, student um, like coffee room or something like that, and you pop into the room and say, okay, I've got this particular study. Would anyone want to help me out? Maybe you've got some money you're paying them, or you can offer them a student credit. And you just go in there and you're basically uh, finding an opportunity sample. The other approach is a random sampling. Now, these are very important for what's called uh, uh, RCTs, randomized control trials. Um, you have to allocate um, a person into usually a control um, group and a intervention, an active intervention group. But you don't want to bias. You don't want to have any bias in terms of who you put into the um, active intervention or the control group. So you, use, you usually use some kind of uh, uh, random sampling um, software package online, and there's, there's a lot of them available. There's another form of um, sampling called systematic sampling. Uh, this is where the system itself selects participants. So if you had a list of people, it might select every second person or every third person on that list. Now, the last form of sampling that I want to uh, discuss is something called stratified sampling. This is where you identify the subgroups and select participants in uh, proportion with uh, uh, particular occurrences. So perhaps you want some subgroups of a particular population, maybe looking at low back pain and how that affects at say levels of depression or anxiety. And you want to have a look at uh, comparing is the effect in terms of psychological damage to the individual, is it different in subgroups such as 18 to 29 year olds, 30 to 49 year olds, and 50 to 59 year olds. So maybe you've got a hypothesis which suggests that the older you get, um, the um, more um, anxiety or depression that you'll experience as a result of your low back pain. Okay, so that's an example of stratified uh, sampling. So the next thing I need to cover are variables. What are variables? Um, so an independent variable is the probably the most important variable that um, you can think of, especially when you're doing uh, experimental designs. And I'll cover the different types of designs in a, in, in a second. Uh, but an independent variable is uh, the variable the experimenter manipulates. Um, and it, it is assumed to have a direct effect uh, on the DV. The DV is the dependent variable or the outcome variable. So I'll just give you an example of what I mean by this. You might have a, a, an experiment that you want to um, test. A hypothesis could be something like um, caffeine versus no caffeine um, will have an effect on student attention. So the obvious thing there in terms of your IV, your independent variable, the thing you're manipulating is whether the group has a caffeinated drink or a non-caffeinated drink. The DV, the dependent measure, is your always your outcome measure. That's your level of attention. So you're testing the attention after they've drunk a caffeine drink and a non-caffeine drink. Now, there's, there's a variety of different ways that we can um, group people in terms of repeated measures design or um, independent measures design. I have a separate video for that. So 
if you look in the um, the the next video that's uh, linked in your blackboard or if this is on YouTube it's in the description uh, listings um, you'll find a second uh, video there and it's going to be called something like uh, between versus within designs or something like that and that will take you through um, between and within designs in a lot more detail um, but have a look at that video if you want to learn something about how um, we as psychological experimenters uh, design our experiments in more detail so um, I've covered something about an independent variable that's the thing that you're manipulating caffeine versus non-caffeine or drug A versus drug B maybe you're looking at um, let's say uh, does drug A maybe it's two different antidepressants drug A is the older antidepressant and drug B is the newer antidepressant and you've got a hypothesis which suggests that the newer um, antidepressant will have a greater effect at reducing depression than the um, older one. Therefore, your DV, your outcome measure, is levels of depression and your IV is whether the participant receives either the uh, drug 1, the antidepressant 1, or drug 2, antidepressant 2. So I hope that's clear. Now, um, when we uh, do these kind of uh, studies, we need to ensure there is, um, we operationalize uh, the variables to make sure they're easily uh, tested. So there's no point saying as a dependent or outcome measure, uh, dependent variable, there's no point uh, calling it uh, educational attainment because uh, that doesn't mean anything. What you'd have to do is call a, your DV, a specific DV, something that is quantifiable. That could be your exam grade. So something you put on a scale from 1 to 100 or 1 to 10 or whatever it is. It's got to be scalable, usually, if you want to do um, a lot of experiments. Or nominal data, counting data, like how many people were smokers versus how many people were non-smokers. It's got to be easily quantifiable. That's how psychological researchers choose to operationalize their experiments. Then you've got the extraneous confounding variables. Um, a confounding variable is basically something outside of the experiment. It's that's affecting potentially the results. Um, so they're not the independent variables that you're. It's something. It's 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 a variable which is causing effect to the. Uh, um, uh, 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 the dependent variable but it's not the independent variable so it's not caffeine or non-caffeine it's something outside of that so consider for instance if you had um, three different fertilizers um, and you had um, one was just mud the second one was uh, an older fertilizer and the third one was a very the newest fertilizer, so supposedly the best fertilizer. Now you might have a hypothesis that says something like um, the um, third fer fer fertilizer, uh, having um, um, a, a plant being uh, so a plant seed that is set in this new fertilizer uh, will grow more. So a plant will grow more in this new fertilizer. Um, than the other two fertilizers or the fertilizer and the non-fertilizer. Now um, that might be the case but let's say you've got an open window, you've got a window by a wall and the plant that's receiving this new fertilizer is closer to this window as opposed to the other two conditions. The condition where the plant is growing in the older fertilizer and a condition where the plant is, is growing in no fertilizer, just mud. Um, the plant that's closest to the window would also be receiving benefit from the light in the terms of photosynthesis. It would take the light and it would use it as an energy resource and therefore it might grow more because it's receiving light. So the growth in the plant might be due to the fact that um, it's receiving additional sunlight, 
as opposed to, let's say, the actual fertilizer. Therefore, sunlight in that particular experiment is the confounding factor. So um, we have to be able to um, control for these things. So that was an example. Confounding factor was a situational variable. Uh, we can control that through standardization. Um, so what we would do, we would not do the fertilizer experiment in a room with, uh, which has a bias on one side of the room uh, with the window. We'd make sure there's no window so one plant can't benefit from the sunlight. And then therefore all three plants are receiving everything equal, same amount of heat, same amount of water. And the only thing that is different is your independent variable that is more um, one's having a, a, a fertilizer, a new fertilizer, the other's having a older fertilizer, um, and one is having um, no fertilizer at all. So those, that's your independent measure. You manipulated the type of fertilizer, and there's no confounding factors which are gonna influence the dependent measure. That's the size of your plant. Um, the other thing is participant variables. We all have differences in terms of our different um, memory capacities. We all have different attention capacities. We all have different abilities and so forth. So these are individual differences in participants. So we try to minimize this through the uh, randomization process. And there's other ways we can do it in terms of match participants and so forth. Uh, but those are the confounding um, variables that we need to be uh, familiar with. And again, I have that separate video and, and that talks about these in a, in a little bit more detail with some pictures. So please check it out. Um, now, experimental design. Um, Again, I'm just going to get into a, um, the different types of design groups. And again, the second video I have uh, goes into this in a bit more detail. Um, so link into that if you want to find out more about uh, repeated versus within a group's design, as I've got some nice pictures and stuff to show you. Um, uh, so an independent measures desire between groups design is uh, a group of participants are recruited and divided by two. The first group does the experimental task with the IV for condition one, and the second group does the experimental task for the IV for condition two. And the outcome measure, the DV, is measured for each group and the results compared. Now, what that means is if I, had, if I was testing caffeine drinks versus non-caffeinated drinks, and the outcome measure DV was attention, and my hypothesis was that um, those drinking the caffeinated drinks would have better attention, um, then I, there's one of two ways I could do this study. I could either take my sample and divide it by two, and then put half of them in the caffeinated drink um, condition, and half the other half in the uh, non-caffeinated drink condition. And then I could compare the attention scores between those in the caffeinated condition and those in the non-caffeinated condition to see if they're different. And if they're different, that would tell me that um, the caffeine uh, is actually having, whether it's actually having effect, because if the mean score, the average score is higher for that, those in the caffeinated drink as compared to the non-caffeinated drink, that's a good indicator for um, uh, the fact that caffeine does actually increase attention levels. A repeated measures design is a within groups design. And this is where you basically, um, you, you, you have that, that, those two, that, that, that group of participants. The IV is the same. It's um, uh, caffeinated drinks and non-caffeinated drinks, but rather than split the group into two, everyone in the group um, has the caffeinated drink and then um, is tested for their attention. Then there is a washout period. So you might wait a week and then you give them the non-caffeinated drink and then you test their attention. And then you're comparing the results when they drank the caffeinated drink in week one 
and the non-caffeinated drink in in uh, uh, week two. Those are the two conditions. So the crucial difference between an independent between groups design and a repeated measures within groups design is in the independent between groups design, you're splitting the group into two and making the comparison. So only half the group has the caffeine and half the group has the um, um, the non-caffeinated drinks and in the repeated measures they all have the caffeinated drinks and they all have the non-caffeinated drinks. In a matched pairs design a group of participants are recruited um, and you're basically trying to find another group of participants um, who have uh, who are matched in terms of um, individual differences. So maybe they're all the same age, they're all the same kind of backgrounds, same kind of educational levels. So you're minimizing um, certain differences. Um, so you're, you're trying to find participants who have similarities um, in terms of um, um, their, um, their kind of individual aspects about them, age, education, and so forth. So you're matching the, 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 the pairs in the design. So a lab experiment. Now a lot of psychology tests are conducted in the laboratory. Uh, this type of experiment is conducted in a well-controlled environment, not necessary laboratories. So you might think of a laboratory as something with test tubes and um, those kind of things. Often a laboratory is just a room with no windows a computer and a table. Lots of uh, uh, psychology labs are just a room with a table and a, uh, a PC. Um, we have them, they're highly controlled, so we can prevent things like confounding measures, like light coming through and affecting uh, plant size. Obviously that's not an, a psychological example, but there are many types of examples where let's say you're doing an attention task or memory task and if it was a noisy room, for instance, then the outcomes of that, that those um, the results might be the fact that uh, there was noise and it distracted the participants and therefore they didn't do well, as opposed to whatever thing that you're comparing, caffeine versus non-caffeine, for instance. So you need a highly controlled uh, to prevent confounding variables. So you need accurate and objective me measurements as possible, and that's why we have these controlled environments. Uh, the researcher decides uh, where the experiment takes place, at what time, with what participants, and often uses a standardized procedure. So we tend to have protocols written up before we do our lab-based experiments. Field experiments, these are conducted in the natural environment of the participants. Um, in a, 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 an artificial setup. So the experiment still manipulates an independent variable, but in a real life setting. So this is not in a laboratory, in a university. Uh, this could be in a hospital, for instance. And there's a, um, an example by Hoffling, it's called the Hoffling Hospital Experiments. And they were looking at the obedience uh, in nurses and the nurse-physician relationship. Um, now, I, I don't know much about this particular experiment, but I can get the gist of it. And what it's basically touching on was looking at um, how unknown doctors, um, could unknown doctors basically um, order a nurse to give a dangerous dose uh, to a patient? Of course, they're not harming patients in this. It was just uh, an experiment to identify would they if they were instructed to by a, uh, a senior physician. Now there's, there's, there's strict hierarchies in hospitals and there's reasons for that uh, but you'd hope the nurse would um, confront the physician in a situation where she or he was being instructed to give a dangerous dose to the patient. Um, now the the point of this particular example is it's conducted in a natural environment. It's it conducted in a hospital environment as opposed to a laboratory. Hence, it's called a field experiment, i.e. it's in a real life setting. A natural experiment are when a naturally occurring IV is investigated, 
that isn't deliberately manipulated. It exists anyway. Uh, participants are not randomly allocated and the natural events may occur uh, rarely. So you've got to sit around and you've got to um, try to gather data from a natural environment. So maybe you're looking at different uh, government systems, communism, capitalism, and how that affects the health of uh, the psychological health of the population. Are there more depressed people in a communist state or a capitalist state? Um, case studies are in-depth investigations of single persons, group, um, event or community. So it's typically a single person. It's called a case because it's an individual case. And um, typical examples of this was the work by someone called Sigmund Freud. He would spend a lot of time having a very detailed investigation in terms of the private lives of the um, person, looking at some of the variables, some of the factors that would lead on to depression or anxiety. And he would, he would try to identify causality through the histories of that person and try to connect it with um, the actual outcomes. So this is very rich uh, data. It's high in ecological validity generally because it's a real case in a real environment. So um, those are the types of studies. Um, there are other types of studies uh, in relation to let's say correlational analysis. Now uh, all of you in school probably did one of these kind of scatter plots at some stage where you have a bunch of dots and you connect them like that. Well, that's a correlation. So your x-axis, this axis at the bottom here um, in, on the horizontal line um, could be let's say uh, how fast you run and this axis here uh, on the y-axis could be um, the impact in terms of um, some kind of subjective experience like a headache so maybe the faster you run you will have a headache um, a, gr a greater migraine as as you run with a headache so there's there's a correlation as one thing goes up so does the other that's the crucial relation it can also go in a negative way like this uh, that would be a negative correlation, this is a positive correlation, or zero correlation, that's a flat line like this. So again, I'll give you another example, uh, let's say the association between um, revision time and fatigue levels, those are positively related. As m the more time you spend re revising, generally the association is that you will be more fatigued, hence this positive um, uh, association. A negative association, one that's going in an inverse direction, would be the length of time you revise and your attention. So the longer you revise, the more you um, lose your attention, so this goes down, hence a negative plot. Um, so those are just associations, but nothing to do with causality. Correlations only test associations. They do not attest uh, this causes this. You'd have to use a regression analysis for that. Um, another type of um, uh, um, study, uh, we've, ex we've talked about uh, correlational designs, we've talked about um, experimental designs in some detail. Another one is interviews. You don't have to have quantitative um, 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 setups, you know, uh, like experimental design with very specific quantitative outcomes like a scale with memory scores. You can actually just run a interview and these can be unstructured in an informal like uh, casual conversation where you're gaining uh, information, it, qualitative information and you're collecting it. A structured formal interview has fixed questions. Most of them have fixed questions. Um, so um, there's a particular protocol the interviewer is following and um, they're trying to basically identify the same kind of qualitative non-numerical information from the participants 
but in a more structured way. A lot of um, the stuff I've done in the past like uh, are semi-structured interviews, and you can deviate from the questions. There is a structured set of questions you have, but you can deviate a little bit from that. Questionnaires, again, this is something that's used a lot in the form of surveys. Uh, they can be carried out face-to-face, -face, telephone or by post. They're normally in written form. Uh, questions can be open-ended, they can allow the flexible responding, uh, or they can be more tightly structured, maybe tick boxes, what they call a Likert scale, like um, how much do you like Diet Coke on a scale of 1 to 10? Um, or how how much do you f how how um, how much do you feel you remember particular events if it was maybe a, a memory task in psychology and it's completely subjective um, um, subjective uh, listing in terms of how much you actually feel as opposed to what is the uh, how much you actually remember from that particular experiment. So questionnaires can basically ask, they're very good at like identifying opinions. What's your opinion on Brexit? What's your opinion on this? What's your opinion on Diet Coke? Uh, how much pain are you in? So again, it has lots of psychological, um, um, uh, 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 there's, there's reasons why psychologists would like to use questionnaires because you can assess, for instance, things like, what is your current mood given this particular situation? How, what's your level of anxiety? So there are, ex there are anxiety questionnaires, there are depression questionnaires, there are memory questionnaires, there are personality questionnaires, there are questionnaires for vir virtually every construct, every psychological construct. Um, the choice of the questions are important. Uh, you don't want to have leading questions or biased or ambiguous types of questions. So developing questionnaires are a very, very important step in that, pr that process. We often use um, questionnaires that other people have generated as opposed to creating our own questionnaires. Observational studies, these are usually, um, for instance, COVID observations. You're just observing. You're not interacting. You're um, observing um, the, you know, what's happening in a particular um, uh, situation. Maybe you're looking at um, children on a in a in a in a school playground and counting the number of times boys are pulling the hair you know uh, of girls and looking at male aggression towards females at an early age that could be an observational so you're not interacting you're just covertly observing of course there are ethical issues with that and if you're observing let's say children on a playground there are particular ethical reasons why that would need to be monitored um, but you need to understand there are always ethical issues with a lot of the things we do in psychology. Um, something you can check out online is called the Stanford Prison Experiment and you can see why we need ethics in psychology. I'll also link that in the uh, blackboard and the description here. Um, there's overt observations where the researcher tells the group he's conducting experiments. So, you, so the people, people being observed know there is an observer there. There is controlled observations. Um, these are more under like laboratory conditions. Um, there are natural observations, just looking at spontaneous behavior being recorded in a natural setting, maybe two people in the conversation. Um, participants, um, the observer has, whether well, the observer has direct contact with the group of people they're observing. So it doesn't necessarily have to be covert or at distance. You can actually participate in the um, observational study, um, but usually it's uh, non-participant. It's fly on the wall. It's from a distance, just observing. The best observational studies are often those which are covert. You're at a distance and you're not impacting the way. So if you sit in a room and you start interacting with two people that you're observing, uh, your interaction is going to um, change the outcomes of how they interact with each other. So you're confounding, again, remember the confounding variable, you're confounding the study. So it's usually best to be the fly on the wall and observe from a distance.
um, covertly. A pilot study. Pilot studies are very, very important. They usually are kind of like the trial run of experiments. When we design an experiment, we tend to want to work out, is our experiment flawed in any way? Could we improve our experiment? Um, so we're basically trying to do a dry run of our experimental procedures and we're trying to uh, identify is there any ambiguities? Are the instructions confusing? Is the information provided to, to the task? Are they clear? Do the participants understand what they're supposed to be doing? So we want to understand that the, the study is not too difficult, and the instructions are clear, it's not ambiguous. And this is why we tend to use pilot studies. You do a full trial and you find out that there are information ambiguous or there's problems with the experiment. You waste a lot of time, energy, money, resources to run that experiment. So pilot studies are very, very good ways of uh, doing a small dry run to test your experiments. Now, I mentioned um, interviewing. Um, when you interview, you're not doing uh, quantitative analysis. It's not questionnaires. It's not like scales, like Likert scales or memory scales or attention scales that are numerical. Um, content and thematic analysis is usually using uh, some kind of uh, qualitative analysis. Usually when you interview people, you will do some kind of thematic analysis and generate themes within that uh, literature. Content analysis has a, has a somewhat of a quantitative component. Um, so it's used as a research tool to indirectly observe the presence of certain words, images, or concepts. Uh, it could be a, 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 um, an interview transcript or media article, advertisement, book, etc. Uh, so you could, for instance, look at doing a content analysis uh, study exploring like gender role stereotyping in uh, the media, for instance. So that would be counting certain words that keep coming up that are specific to gender role stereotyping. So we know there can be gender role bias in the media and we're looking at actually explicitly identifying this. The researchers quantify in the sense they count and then analyze the presence on uh, meanings and relationships of words and concepts and make inferences about the messages within the media, uh, the writers, the audience, and even the culture and time uh, in which these take place. Um, to conduct a content analysis on any such media, the media is coded or broken down into manageable categories on a variety of levels. So word, word sentence, phrase, sentence, theme are all examined. So that's one type of a uh, qualitative analysis. Um, another thing we do in psychological research is something called systematic reviews and meta-analyses. This is a synth uh, synthesis of like existing literature. So it's a review, it's taking all the published work that people are doing over a period of time on one particular area, maybe uh, all the studies conducted in the area of low back pain leading to uh, um, some kind of uh, anxiety and depression. We want to know what studies out there show uh, us some stuff in terms of um, uh, levels of anxiety and depression um, in relation to low back pain. So a meta-analysis is, is, a, is a, a systematic review uh, that involves identifying an aim and then searching for, for research studies that have addressed similar aims and hypotheses. So it's synthesizing similarities in studies which have similar aims, aims and hypotheses. This is done by looking through various databases uh, and then decisions are made about what studies are to be included, excluded. Um, we are, um, so we're not going to go through that specific process. Uh, we identify databases like the Cochrane database, uh, psych info database, there's various databases that have a bunch of studies. We extract these things, then we usually do a, um, some kind of uh, bias analysis, um, uh, looking at uh, um, study biases, you know, was it properly randomized and stuff like that. We're looking at the quality of the studies. 
and then we synthesize something from that. So the strengths of this approach is increases the validity of the conclusions drawn from a, from a wider range of research. There are also weaknesses of this type of approach because the research designs can vary, the outcome measures might vary, and, and, and it questions whether these are truly comparable. So if you're using, if you've got a study that's found high depression on one depression scale, let's say the, the, the Beck's depression scale, does that, is that similar to uh, studies that you've identified where you find high depression when they're using a POMS depression measure? So, you know, it, it, are these things truly comparable? Um, so maybe there's studies there that have identified low mood. Is that the same as depression? Well, you've got to be the, you've got to answer that question if you're doing a systematic review. So those are the weaknesses of doing these kind of um, large meta-analyses um, meta and systematic reviews. Um, types of data, you've got the quantitative data, um, that's numerical data, that's like reaction times or number of mistakes. Um, it represents how much or how long, how many there are of something. Uh, tally of uh, behavioral categories, number of men or women smoking, maybe you're comparing male smokers and female smokers and you just want to know in the student population um, are there more men smokers or female smokers again that's all types of quantitative uh, data reaction time that's quantitative data so they usually close questions on a uh, questionnaire uh, or you've collected data in a laboratory like reaction times or memory scores or number of mistakes or something like that those are all forms of uh, quantitative data Qualitative data, we mentioned this with the content analysis, this is non-numerical uh, data. So even with content analysis, you had like uh, counts of certain words, but it's really looking at the words and word constructs. So qualitative data is looking at um, themes in your data, trying to understand your data. So these are usually extracted using open questions and questionnaires or interviews, observational studies, to collect this kind of qualitative data. So it's transcripts, for instance, that you've recorded through an interview, and then you're looking for themes within that, that, that and you're basically looking at maybe attitudes towards something. So perhaps if it was a psychology experiment, you're looking at pe people with pain, uh, you're looking at um, things, situations that might cause pain, and how that pain affects their quality of life. So maybe if you've got pain, they, they'll say things like, yes, it affects my social life. It also affects my work life. Well, social life might be one theme that you identify, and work life might be one theme that you identify in the broader category of quality of life. So those are themes extracted from um, interview data. There's also primary data. This is first-hand data collected for the purpose of investigation. And secondary data. Secondary data is, is data being collected by someone else. You're taking the data and you're basically looking at some kind of secondary analysis on that data that wasn't previously analyzed. You've also got things like validity. Um, this is where the observed effect is, in, uh, um, is genuine and represents what is actually out there in the world. You've got uh, concurrent validity, this is the extent to which a psychological measure relates to existing similar measures. So if you've basically um, created some kind of psychological measure, does that relate, if you create a new questionnaire, does that relate to existing like um, um, depression measures? So if you develop a new depression measure, does it, how does it relate to the Beck's depression measure? How does it relate to the POMS? So it's gonna have some kind of similarity if they're both measuring um, um, depression or anxiety um, or intelligence, then you want to basically ensure that they're at least similar in some ways to existing measures. And that's called cons uh, concurrent validity. Face validity is basically just an eyeballing of the measures, maybe by an expert. So if you were to construct a, um, a, a measure, let's say a pain, um, scale um, or a anxiety scale maybe you'd send it off to a pain expert or a uh, anxiety expert and then you ask them to basically test uh, face test it just basically have a look at it eyeball it and get their opinion 
does it actually measure what it's supposed to measure? So that comes with a bit of experience. Ecological validity is the extent to which findings from a research study can be generalized to other settings, real life situations. So laboratory um, settings, unfortunately, typically do not have very good um, ecological validity. Um, and then you've got uh, temporal uh, validity, the extent to which findings from a research study can be dis uh, generalized to historical times. So is it translatable to different times? Reliability is a measure of consistency if a particular uh, measure is repeated and the same result is obtained, it, um, it can be described as being reliable. Example of this is inter-rater inter reliability and in intra-rater reliability. Inter-rater reliability is basically if, you, if the same person was assessing some kind of pain outcome, do they have the same scores if they are on the same person, the same conditions and context, if they, if they basically um, uh, conducted that particular um, rate, uh, rating twice. So if they were assessing something, do they come up with the same um, rate uh, um, scores twice? And if they do, then it's an indication if it, that it's more reliable. An intra-rate reliability is um, um, between, intra is, um, I believe, um, between people and inter is uh, within the same person. Test, retest reliability is assessing the same person on two different occasions. Uh, Inter-observer reliability, again, if you've basically got two people um, observing something, you want them to both agree on it. So when we do qualitative research, for instance, uh, one person might have a look at the themes and then another person has to look at the themes and they both got to agree on the themes generated to ensure there is reliability in that process. Um, basic concepts of science are paradigms a set of shared assumptions and agreed methods within the scientific discipline. Um, I'll give you an example of this. A paradigm in psychology was the um, uh, introspective design by Freud. And that was that uh, we could understand scientific principles and how people think by looking in on ourselves, reflecting in on our own moods and thoughts and feelings. Um, that's an introspective approach paradigm. That moved away, so the behavioral paradigm came around. That was observing specific behaviors. So um, if you understand what the, uh, the, the Pav Pavlovian experiments, uh, Ivan Pavl Pavlov's dogs, um, check those out. Those are on, um, uh, you can easily find those online. And basically it shifted away from an introspective approach to a behavioral approach. Then the cognitive revolution came. So again, psychology shifted to a cognitive paradigm. And that was looking at things like um, thoughts and uh, within, you know, outside of specific behaviors like memory, uh, thought, attention, those kind of things, and the paradigm shifted again. So a paradigm shift is where the uh, scientific revolution in terms of a, a change in the, the dominant unifying theory in terms of a scientific discipline. Psychologies have many um, paradigm shifts over this time. Introspection with Freud, um, behavioral science with Ivan Pavlov and Skinner, and um, the cognitive revolution with the start was uh, Chomsky with language, and that's obviously um, the dominant one today. Um, now, there's also things you need to understand in terms of concepts of science, in terms of objectivity. We want to remove our personal bias. We believe in something. Sometimes we we have the unconscious desire to influence the findings. We have to be ob objective as possible and remove personal bias as much as possible because we want to find things that are free of bias. Um, the empirical method is a scientific approach based on gathering up evidence and direct observations. But these are all the approaches I've just basically mentioned, the lab-based the lab-based experiments, the uh, field experiments, the natural experiments, observational experiments, they're all, ex they're all empirical methods. Um, we want to be able to replicate the findings, so if we can't repeat findings under the same condition, there's a problem. 
we need we need to be able to replicate our findings. The other problem is uh, falsifiability. If we can't um, test a, a, a hypothesis and find it to be untrue, that's a problem. A lot of the earlier Freudian stuff in terms of introspection uh, lacked falsifiability, and that simply meant that we couldn't test because it was all symbolic and within us. We couldn't test. That's that's partly why the behavioral uh, principles came about because people wanted things to be objective and falsifiable. So the the, the empirical methods came about. The uh, introspective methods of Freud were not empirically based. And we have to also understand um, psychology is heavy on statistics. Um, I've got a couple of videos. You can have a look at those on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you just go to darrenedwards.info and if you scroll down, you'll see YouTube videos and you see a whole bunch of um, statistics. And I, I use those for my master's courses as an introduction to statistics and SPSS and all that kind of stuff. We haven't, uh, we can't go into this in much detail, but what I can do is, is tell you statistics is where we're basically testing a hypothesis. Um, we, a significant result in an experiment is one where there is a low probability that, that, that chance factors were responsible for an observed difference correlation or association in the variables tested. If our test is significant, we can, re we can reject our null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. If our tests were non-significant, um, we can accept the, the uh, null hypothesis and reject the alternative hypothesis or actual hypothesis. Uh, a null hypothesis is a statement of no effect, i.e. there will be no difference between um, drinking caffeine and not drinking caffeine uh, in terms of uh, increase in uh, change in attention or mood or whatever it is. So it's a no, it's a no difference um, prediction. Whereas a hypothesis, an alternative hypothesis is our prediction. There will be a change. There will be a difference between caffeine drinkers and non-caffeine drinkers in terms of their um, the attention levels or memory levels. So in psychology we use p is smaller than 0 0.05. If you read a lot of papers in psychology you'll often see p is smaller than 0 0.05 in the results section. Uh, basically what the psychologists are trying to strike a balance between making type 1 and type 2 errors. Um, so um, uh, sometimes they reduce it down to um, p is smaller than 0 0.01 um, basically, the smaller that number, the better, the more confident you are that you've um, found uh, uh, an observed difference, which uh, is uh, is not due to chance factors. Uh, zero point zero five. You're basically saying if you if you find a p is zero is below zero point zero five or uh, the same as, that's uh, about a one in twenty. Uh, comparisons in which your null hypothesis is true. So if you did the experiment 20 times, in only in one situation should you find that there is no um, there is no difference between uh, no observed difference between the two groups. Uh, a type one error is when the null hypothesis is rejected when it should not have been um, when it should have been accepted. Uh, happens when a lenient significance level is used. Uh, the error of uh, optimism and a type 2 error is when the null hypothesis is, is accepted when it should have been rejected um, and happens when a, a, um, um, a stringent significance level is used so you don't want the p-value to be overly small or overly large and that's why it's a, it's a trade-off between the type 1 and type 2 errors so that's in a nutshell you know what's the what the statistics is basically telling you is do you have confidence i guess in your hypothesis are you confident that it, this is not due to chance factors and we in psychology we like to ensure that there is um, about a one in 20 chance that the null hypothesis is true
So if you repeated the experiment 20 times, only in one situation would you find no significant difference, no difference between the two observed uh, conditions. Um, finally, um, just talking about ethics. Ethics is really, really important in psychological research. You need informed consent. You need to ensure the participants understand what the experiment is about. They need to consent to doing the experiment. Um, again, check out like the Stanford Prison Experiment online. Um, that was very. That was back in the days of lacking of ethics in psychology, and they did a lot of things without informed consent, and it caused a lot of distress to the people. So, informed consent is very, very important. We should not deceive participants. Deception should only be used when approved in an ethics committee. It shouldn't be um, damaging to the, the, the participants. All participants should have the right to withdraw. Um, all participants should be protected from harm. And there should always be confidentiality in terms of uh, communicating information. So we shouldn't hold information with full names, addresses, and so forth. That's very, very, very important, uh, especially with the GDPR uh, rules. Um, so those are the ethical issues. So that's it. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. And um, again, please watch those additional um, videos that I've produced that goes into a bit more in terms of within and between groups design. Um, read um, this excellent research methodology books. There's one by Bryman. Um, I'm sure there's also psychology books. Uh, Bryman is a social research method, but again, a lot of these uh, things that we've discussed is applicable to both psychology and social research methods. So uh, those are the, the, the main key factors, and I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much.